All right, so uh, here is part three, our final installment of the Sabbath day studies. So let's, let's uh, remind you again, these are not standalone lessons. Part three now is flowing through after parts one and two. Part three now is going to finish off the series. We'll make some concluding remarks at the end of this. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in this final study on the Sabbath day, and this is where it gets critical, is what is our relationship to the Sabbath day? As members of the church, the body of Christ, a people living in the age of grace, following the dispensation of your grace, what about us in the Sabbath day? We thank you and praise you, and we hope that this will solidify in our minds what you think is most important about the Sabbath day. In Christ's name with thanksgiving, amen. So, Acts 13, Acts 13, if you know anything about dispensational Bible study, rightly dividing the word of truth, Pauline dispensationalism, also called mid-Acts dispensationalism, you know that Paul is our apostle, Romans 11, 13. Paul is God's spokesman to us, the God of Israel is not speaking, us to, speaking to us today in the writings of Moses. Now, Moses is God's word, but it is God's word to the nation Israel. We study all the Bible. As you notice, we read non-Pauline verses already. We don't throw away any part of the Bible. We simply understand where we are in the Bible, where we are on the timeline of God's dealings with man. It's very important that we know where we are in the Bible. Because if we land in a part of the Bible that is not to or about us, we're in trouble. And really, we're setting ourselves up to be deceived. And Satan will use the Bible, but he won't rightly divide the Bible. He quoted the Bible. Matthew 4, Luke 4. Satan knows the Bible. He quoted the Bible to Jesus Christ, but he didn't quote it properly, and he didn't quote it dispensationally. He misquoted it, and he misapplied it. So Acts 13, verse 14. So somebody would say, well, Brother Sean, Paul observed the Sabbath day, and since Paul is our apostle, we should observe the Sabbath day as well. Just like those who would say, well, Paul water baptized, we should be water baptizing too. Well, Acts 13, why was Paul doing what he was doing in Acts? Acts 13, 14. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. So this would be uh, back in verse 2, Barnabas, Saul, when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Verse 27, For they that dwell at Jerusalem, now this is Paul speaking, and their rulers, because they knew him not, Messiah, Jesus, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So, we learn here in verse 14, as well as verse 27, and we saw in part 2, Luke 4, 16 to 21, the prophets are read on the Sabbath day in the synagogues. The law and the prophets, the word of God, what we would call the Old Testament, 
is read in the synagogues on the Sabbath days. Let's turn to Acts 15, 21. Acts 15, 21. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. So, like what was said in part two, Christ heard their ministry, the Sabbath day was a time of instruction. The Jews were to go to the synagogues, and the synagogues began to uh, pro uh, proliferate once the temple was destroyed. The Babylonians destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And these synagogues be began popping up in the centuries before Christ. And they're there with, with Christ or the ministry, and they're there in the book of Acts with the Apostle Paul, and so on, scattered around the, the Roman Empire and beyond, and so on. These synagogues here are places of assembling, uh, churches, Jewish churches, if you want to call them that, uh, if it makes it any easier. And as we notice, well, Paul would show up at the synagogue and teach, just like Christ. Turning to Acts chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Phipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Thus we have Paul doing some Sabbath day evangelism among apostate Israel. Lost Israel. This is not the little flock. This is not Peter and the eleven. This is not the righteous nation that has believed on Jesus Christ as, as Messiah, as King, as Redeemer. These are unsaved Jews, and so Paul is preaching to them to convert them into the church, the body of Christ. They have to realize that the one they have crucified as a fraud, he is Christ. And so Paul, it says, verse 2, Acts 17, 2, Paul, as his manner was, went into them three Sabbath days. He reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Three Sabbath days, as his manner was. So Paul made it a habit of going into synagogues and teaching Israel. Paul made it a, a custom of speaking to unsaved Jews, assembling in those synagogues. Let's turn to chapter 18 of Acts, verse 4. So Paul is in Corinth, he leaves Athens, he goes to Corinth, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So Paul is going around. We've seen now in numerous places, and it's his custom, Acts 17, as his manner was, he goes to the synagogues and he preaches to them on the Sabbath days. And that's when their assembling is on the Sabbath days. 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. And we'll read 2, 22. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but un under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some." Paul is approaching people 
so that they will receive what he has to say. He is trying to be as approachable to them as possible. He is not trying to turn them off. He is not trying to antagonize them and strive with them and fight with them and have a flesh fest. Like Philippians 1 says, there are those who preach Christ out of strife and contention. They don't want to get anyone saved. What they want to do is enter a, a, an intellectual fighting ring. They want to prove something, how smart they are, how knowledgeable they are in the Bible, how clever they are, uh, how, how rude they are, how mean, how vicious, how uh, uh, combative they are. But see, Paul, Paul understood the idea that if I'm going to reach these unsaved Jews in the book of Acts, I will have to approach them in such a way as to gently introduce myself to them. And so what he would do is, Paul would go in the synagogues in the book of Acts, and since the Jews, unsaved Israel, they're most receptive there to the truth on the Sabbath day, and here they are in a spiritual environment, they're going to be most receptive to hearing the gospel of the grace of God. That's, he's, going to, he's going to take advantage of the opportunity he has and he's going to be very strategic he will enter those synagogues if there is a synagogue there and he will he will be ready to expound the word of God that they have had for centuries Israel has had for centuries and yet they've had no understanding they've had the scrolls but they don't know what those scrolls mean when their Messiah came to fulfill those prophecies they did not have the spiritual insight, the capacity to see Messiah for who he was. And they missed Jesus entirely. So now, through the fall of Israel, Romans 11, salvation has come to the Gentiles to provoke Israel to jealousy. Part of that provoking ministry, to, uh, to Paul's provoking ministry to Israel, is going to those synagogues and announcing Acts 13, Acts 18, Acts 28. We're going to the Gentiles. You count yourself unworthy of eternal life, Israel? We go to the Gentiles, Acts 18. We go to the Gentiles, Acts 28. The salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. So the Holy Spirit is working through Paul and telling Israel, your program is on hold, it's paused, that millennial rest is not coming right now. I'm doing something differently apart from your prophetic program. I've started the mystery program with the Apostle Paul's salvation and commissioning in Acts 9 on the road to Damascus there. They need to be mindful of that and they need to see our only hope to avoid that wrath to come is to join the church, the body of Christ. So Paul is visiting the synagogues on the Sabbath day, just like Christ was, one where most Jews are physically assembled, he can reach a, a large audience at once, where they're most receptive, when they're most receptive to spiritual truths. And lastly, remember God had instituted the Sabbath day with Moses as a time of instruction. Rather than them working and, and, and being concerned with what their efforts were, they were to think about, well, why did God work those six days and then stop working? He rested because the time to work had passed and now he was going to enjoy the, the fruit of his work, the result of his labor. Now, Paul never, and pay close attention, Paul never, ever, 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 ever preached the gospel of the kingdom. He never once offered Israel the gospel of the kingdom. He never offered Israel her kingdom in the book of Acts, ever. What Paul was showing Israel is, your program is on hold. Jerusalem is apostate. And since Jerusalem, the city of the great king, has been deceived and is under Satan's control, 
The kingdom cannot be offered to, to Jerusalem anymore. That time has passed, and Paul is traveling physically farther and farther and farther away from Jerusalem. And by the time the book of Acts closes, he's well off in Rome, the world capital of the time. He's not preaching Israel's kingdom gospel outside of Israel's land. That doesn't make sense. The twelve apostles were preaching Israel's kingdom gospel in Israel's land. When Israel fell, that program is not valid today. The fall of Israel, Acts 7, the raising up and commissioning, uh, the, the, the salvation raising up commissioning of Paul in Acts 9, Saul of Tarsus, that program associated with the Sabbath day and God's earthly program and God's earthly purpose, Adam and Eve and Israel, that's all on hold, that thousand year reign, that earthly kingdom of God, that's on hold. But Paul never, ever offered Israel her kingdom. Paul couldn't offer Israel's kingdom outside of Israel's land like that. It doesn't make sense. The gospel whereby Paul was saved is the gospel whereby those he preached to were saved. If they, if they were saved, they had to be saved the same way he, he was. He had been delivered from Israel. He was delivered from the prophetic program because he had blasphemed the Holy Spirit and now although he had blasphemed the Holy Spirit and there wasn't forgiveness in the prophetic program for him Matthew 12 31 and 32 Israel couldn't get forgiveness once they blasphemed the Holy Spirit and they did that in early Acts well see that's in Israel's program they couldn't get forgiveness but if our program had started with Paul in Acts 9 well then, the, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, that wouldn't apply anyway. That only applied to Israel's prophetic program. In our dispensation of grace, and see there's no room that I can add it, but we would be, if you wanted to put us, I would erase this, put a line, and a little gap here, that would be the dispensation of grace followed by Daniel's 70th week and then the thousand years. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and then early Acts gives way to Paul's ministry, the dispensation of grace, Romans through Philemon, and then Daniel's 70th week all the way through the thousand years and the new heaven and new earth. That's Hebrews through Revelation. Moving right along kind of move in a little quickly in this hour, but Colossians 2. Now, we read this extensively in our Feast of Jehovah series a couple weeks back. So, you haven't forgotten, have, it, have you? Luke not Luke. Colossians 2, verse 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility in worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. We'll stop the companion passage is Galatians 4 9 through 11 but now after that ye are no ye have known God or rather are known of God how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage ye observe days and months and times and years I am afraid of you lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. So here we have these individuals who, verse 21, tell me ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? So here are some legalists. They're Moses-oriented in, the, in, the, in the, the region of central and southern Turkey 
Galatia here, they are following people who teach the Mosaic Law. Uh, we would call them Galatianists. They mix law and grace. They mix law and grace. And what Paul says is, you are under the weak and beggarly elements, and you desire to be again in bondage, observing days, months, times, years. See, that's Israel's religious calendar. You compare that to Colossians 2. The new moons, the holy days, the Sabbath days. Legalism. And Paul says, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Legalism is performed to get the blessing. God gives rules and regulations. You, you follow them, you obey them, and He'll bless you with reward. Now see, the flip side is, if you don't work, you get the curse. That's what Israel had contracted with Jehovah God back in Exodus 19 and 20 and so on. But we're not under that perform and get the blessing system. Today, we're not under the performance-based accepted system. Today, we're under the grace-based accepted system or the Jesus Christ-based acceptance system. Not what we do, but what He does. So we have individuals today who will And I'll, uh, I'm feeling uh, in a pink mood, a very manly color. <laughs> so we have individuals, now see our dispensation of grace, I'm going to have to modify, otherwise we will not have room to do what I want to do there. So I'm going to modify it slightly. Yeah, okay. So we have Christ's earthly ministry, Matthew to John, and those miracles point back, like that. And then we have right here Hebrews through Revelation. And this is Daniel's 70th week, and then the thousand years, and so on, second coming of Christ. And in between here, we have the D-O-G, dispensation of grace. The miracles of Christ's earthly ministry point to that kingdom that way. So, back and forward. Now, the D-O-G, you will have individuals. Now we can use our little manly color. Pink. <clears throat> so, we're going to, so what we have people in our dispensation of grace today is they will take the Sabbath day and force it onto us and say, well, if the Bible says to do it, it must be for us. All the promises in the book are mine. I better grab that because I'll probably need it later. All the promises in the book are mine. Well, in the case of the Sabbath day, see, just like with the water baptism and the tithing and the tongues and the spiritual gifts, healing and so on, we have people who grab from the Bible. And they don't rightly divide the word of truth. They grab from other dispensations. And they try to make us follow God's word to somebody else. Now faith, faith is doing, faith is believing what God says to you. Faith is not you doing what God told somebody else to do. Faith is not believing and going do what somebody else was told to do. God's word to us is Paul's epistles. Now it is scriptural. To keep the Sabbath day. Because we just read in our earlier lessons. Exodus 20. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Exodus 31. Keep the Sabbath day. 
And yet when you come to our apostle, he says, it makes no difference keeping the Sabbath day today. Now we have individuals such as the Seventh-day Adventists, and they will tell us that part of Christian living is keeping the Sabbath. Now they understand it's Saturday, not Sunday, but whether you say the Sabbath is Saturday or Sunday, you're still wrong if you're going to say that that's for us. The Sabbath has always and always has always been in the Bible and always will be in the Bible. Saturday. When Paul was dealing with the nation Israel during that transitional period of Acts, that provoking ministry in Acts, he went to the synagogue and he commemorated the Sabbath day. When he writes to us in his epistles, Romans through Philemon, never once does Paul instruct us to go to Sabbath day service at any synagogue. So, should I use another nice color? Ah, oh, what about a purple? So, while Paul goes to the synagogues on the Sabbath day in the book of Acts, when God deals directly with us and he writes to us in Paul's epistles, God never, ever tells us to take the Sabbath day and put ourselves under that obligation. How do we know? Galatians 4 verse 11, Paul says, I'm afraid of you. If you will observe days, months, times, and years, I'm afraid. Why is he afraid? It's not like scared shaking in his sandals. He didn't wear boots. Scared shaking in his sandals. He says, I'm afraid of you in that, hey, Galatians, you haven't understood God's word to you through me. You have moved from grace and you're now following a system that is in the Bible but not dispensationally correct. It's scriptural but not dispensational. It does not apply to you. And let me say this. If you are doing something that God told someone else to do, it appears like you're, you're doing something good and right. In actuality, you are working in tandem with Satan. Yes, Satan is the master deceiver and he loves to fool people. He loves to fool us. And if we don't understand the Bible rightly divided, not simply just reading the Bible or know the Bible, memorize the Bible, but if we don't have a rightly divided Bible in our mind, we will be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4, 14. That's where the, most professing Christians are today. They are tossed round about. And you have ministers, like the ministers of righteousness, they're called. Ooh, what's this, a, a maroon? You have ministers who will take Verses from the Mosaic economy, including Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is also the Old Testament, really. They will take those verses and make you, well, make you follow in the dispensation of grace. Grab those verses and force them on to us. See? And you can be scriptural and be out of God's will. That's why there's no power in the professing church today. It's because we're not following what God's doing. We're not doing what God's doing. And since we're not doing what, what God is doing, we're wasting our time and we're getting frustrated. We're defeated and impotent. And just like Israel was not doing what God was doing in her program, and she wound up crippled spiritually, 
Well, we're the same way today doctrinally. We're doctrinally impotent. Now, there are many professing believers, genuine members of the body of Christ. They understand Christ died for their sins, He was buried, and He rose again the third day for their justification. They understand that through His shed blood, they have forgiveness of sins. But they don't, they don't know, they don't have the knowledge of the truth. They haven't come to the knowledge of the truth. God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So for those who would say, well, I'm saved, Brother Sean, that's all that matters. Now, God would disagree because it's not simply God's will that you be saved, 1 Timothy 3, sorry, I knew I'd get it wrong, 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. Well, let's look at it. It's better to look than to quote. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. There's the salvation. There's the justification unto eternal life. There's the forgiveness of sins. Now here's the knowledge of the truth. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. And it was to Paul alone, Paul directly, that the gospel, the grace of God, Christ died in due time for all men. That is the knowledge of the truth. To, the knowledge of the truth is not simply to be saved, but to know where to go in the Bible to get the information how to be saved as well as how to have the Christian life operate in your life. So when we come to the issue of coming to the knowledge of the truth with respect to the Sabbath day, what would God have us conclude about the Sabbath? Let me show you a verse that's thrown around in just about every commentary, every sermon, every radio broadcast, every television broadcast. Here is the verse that you will hear concerning us on the Sabbath day. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. You probably guessed it. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And it says there, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. This is the Apostle John. And it says he's in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now what is the Lord's day? The Lord's day, as most people would define it, they would say, Sunday, the Christian Sabbath. Now, I want you to notice something. Remember, this is fifth grade English, sixth grade English. What did the verse say? I was in the Spirit on the Christian Sabbath. I was in the Spirit on the Sabbath. I was in the Spirit on the first day of the week. I was in the Spirit on Sunday. No. See, see what it says is, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Now, there's this ridiculous idea that John is worshiping on Sunday, and wham, God gives him the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hey, that, that has nothing to do with Sunday, and there isn't one verse in the whole Bible, you can mark my words here, there is never one day anywhere in the Bible where somebody is writing the Word of God and they say, you know what, I was in, I, God told me on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They never give the name of a day like that. They'll give the month. They'll say in the 10th month or the first day of the month, but they will never give the day of the week like that. So that'd be very strange. 
very abnormal that you would have Revelation 1.10, the last book of the Bible here, just out of thin air saying, hey, I was having a, a worship service on Sunday when I got the revelation of Jesus Christ. Sunday has nothing to do with the book of the Revelation. Do you know of anything in the Old Testament called the Lord's Day? Well, you see, the Hebrew doesn't have the possessive like this. So it doesn't say the Lord's Day, but in Hebrew, you see, this would be Greek Revelation 1 verse 10. In Hebrew, it would be the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the time of God's wrath and reign. It's, it, it's a, uh, remember at the beginning of our first, uh, the first study, there are times where I said yom can mean a period of time, like our day and age, or it can be a 24-hour period, like in Genesis 1. When the case of the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the Lord's day, is not a 24-hour period. It's a long span of time. It's hundreds of years, really. It began with the Babylonian captivity. It, it goes all the way to our dispensation of grace beginning. It hops over our dispensation of grace, and it runs all the way through the thousand-year reign of Christ. That is the day of the Lord. That's the Lord's day. Now, that fits with Re Re Revelation's theme. Re Daniel's 70th week, the millennium, and the new heaven, new earth. There's nothing in the book of the Revelation about Sunday. There's nothing in the book of the Revelation about us, the church, the body of Christ. Remember who is our apostle, Paul. We don't go to the book of John. We don't go to John's book. The apostle John an apostle of Israel, Galatians 2, verse 9, and say, that's for us, let's grab. See? So if we turn to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you Lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And Acts 20, verse 7. Acts 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. So we have these saints here assembling on the first day of the week. And we have in 1 Corinthians 16, some saints gathering on the first day of the week, gathering a collection to take to the poor saints in Jerusalem. Remember, we're in that Acts transitional period. Paul's Gentile converts are giving donations to the little flock in Jerusalem because of that famine in Acts 11. And because they had sold all things common, they, had, they sold all, all things and had all things common, and they're, they're, they're waiting for the kingdom to come. Israel's little flock is waiting for the kingdom. And it's not come yet because our dispensation of grace interrupted. So they're poor. And so since we are benefiting from Israel's fall, then it is only appropriate that the body of Christ in the book of Acts, that they would bless Israel with material blessings. That's Romans 15. Moving along. Now, the, see, you would ask people, or you would read commentaries, and they would say, well, Acts 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. Oh, well, the cross-reference to that is the Lord's Day. Revelation 1.10. Wrong. You see, we're not rightly dividing the word of truth if we say that. Acts 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, didn't say the Lord's Day, did it? Didn't say the Christian Sabbath, didn't say the Saturday Sabbath. It said Sunday. And if words mean anything, Sunday is not the Lord's Day. Saturday is not the Lord's Day. 
Sunday is not the Christian Sabbath. You, you see, words mean something. Don't, don't mix terms like that. If Acts 20 verse 7 says the first day of the week, don't make that say the Lord's Day. Don't make that say the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the last day of the week, not the first day. And according to Colossians 2 and Galatians 4, there is no Christian Sabbath in the dispensation of grace. Whether it's Saturday or Sunday, it makes no difference. We don't have a Sabbath at all as members of the church, the body of Christ. See, but if you don't write and divide the word of truth, you just grab from wherever you can in the Bible and say, well, God said it, let me do it. I'm following God's will. And you're, you're not. Quoting the Bible. Yes, there will be people. Now, this goes beyond uh, daily Christian living. We're talking about lost people now. Do you know lost people? They'll be quoting the Bible and go to hell. Yeah, they'll be Acts 2.38. No, another dispensation. God's going to say, that's not true for us today. Mark 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. God says, no, nope, not true today. You still go to hell. You have those who say, keep the commandments. Those who say, you know, give the tithes, go to heaven. And God says, no, nope, not for today. See, they'll be quoting scripture and they'll be falling right into hell. God is very particular when it comes to the gospel whereby we are saved today. We don't just claim anything we want in the Bible. Name it and claim it. We have to know what is the gospel that God gave to the Apostle Paul to entrust to us. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 and 4. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16, 31. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith, not his works, his faith is counted or imputed for righteousness. Romans 4, verse 5. Wherefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith and not by works. He that believeth in Jesus, trusts in Jesus Christ and his righteousness, will have eternal life. So when you have those who, who, who boast about observing days in the dispensation of grace and times and years like that, holy days, Sabbath days, new moons, Romans 14, watch. Romans 14, verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be per fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. For he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. This is how a mature saint is to view those who are immature saints. The immature saint is somebody who gets hung up on rules and regulations like that. In the dispensation of grace, we are not bound to observe kosher food laws and Israel's religious days. But if somebody is weak in the faith and the doctrine, they haven't grasped the dispensation of grace. They don't understand how grace and law do not mix. Well, they are immature. And so... Sabbath day keeping is not a sign of spirituality today. Sabbath day keeping is not a sign of piousness, piety, I should say, or holy living. Sabbath day keeping, whether you are observing Saturday or Sunday, makes no difference to God. If you're observing days like that to try to get the blessing, God says that's immature. 
It is Sabbath day observance and the dispensation of grace is a mark of spiritual immaturity. Legalism, it's weak and beggarly. Now, see, Paul, Paul never gives us a specific day to worship. The Holy Spirit, through Paul, never says, you have to observe this day for worship and rest. See, there are those who would say today, well, God says you take the seventh day off so you can rest and worship. No, every day we worship God. Not just on, not one day a week, we worship God every day of the week. We should present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable under the Lord, unto the Lord, which is our reasonable service. That's true every day. That's not true just on Saturday or Sunday. Every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, we should be worshiping God. Because if you're going to say, well, we only worship God on Sunday, Sunday mornings, and Sunday evening, and Wednesday morning. Well, then what are you doing for the rest of the week? If you call one part of the, the time worship, that means you're not worshiping God the other days. Every day we worship God. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. When, when uh, the issue about observing the Lord's Supper there, Paul doesn't say you have to observe it once a, once a week, once a month, four times a year, three times a year, as often as you do it. Verse 33, when you come together, my brethren, to eat, tarry one for another. You see, there's no set schedule that you have to observe. You have to come and worship with Christians on this day of the week, and that day of the week. See, God wants, to, wants us to avoid ritualism like that. Because what happened with Israel is they didn't learn the lesson on the day. They simply worshipped the day itself. They didn't learn His Word on that day set apart. They just worshipped that day, and they corrupted that day with their traditions of men. Now today we have the same concept going around. Let's see, like the Roman Catholic Church in the Catechism, it says that Sunday has replaced for us what Israel had in Saturday, and that's not true. See, we don't have a Sabbath day. It, whether it's Saturday or Sunday, we don't have a Sabbath day, period. There's no such thing as the Lord's Day and the dispensation of grace. There's no such thing as the Christian Sabbath and the dispensation of grace. That's nothing but religious tradition. So Colossians 2, once again, and this time we'll look at the broader context. Colossians 2, verse 8. And we'll read on down through 17. Colossians 2, verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. See, spoil you, rob you. Philosophy, vain deceit, the tradition of men, the rudiments of the world. There are various ways by which believers not can be robbed, literally. Uh, but, and they can't really be robbed spiritually either. Whatever we have in Christ, nobody can take from us. But they can take away our knowledge of what we have in Christ, our awareness. And that's what religion's designed to do here. The traditions of men, the philosophy, the vain deceit, the rudiments of this world. They're not after Christ. They're not following Christ. They're following Satan is what they're doing. And if we follow them, then we're not following Christ either. We're following Satan as well. 
verse 14, it's Christ, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or, res or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from which all the body of joints and bands having nourishment minister and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore if ye be dead with the Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are you subject to ordinances? See, touch not, taste not, handle not. See, asceticism. Give up stuff in religion. Fast. Uh, don't indulge in, in self-pleasure. Uh, Self-denial. Give up pleasures, like lint, you know, which are all to, the, to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So in the context of holy days, new moons, and Sabbath days, God says, do you know people can use those instructions I gave Israel? He, they can use that to deceive you and to spoil you corrupt you, contaminate you, distract you. And that's what we have today in those individuals. Maybe they're, hopefully, they're well-meaning, they're sincere, but they're pushing us to be legalistic. Follow the Sabbath day, the Christian Sabbath of Sunday, or the original Sabbath of Saturday. And we just have to say, no, you're spoiling me. You're trying to rob me of my completeness in Christ, the knowledge that I have in Him, the spiritual awareness, the spiritual health that I have in His Word rightly divided. And you say, I will not be put under that yoke of bondage, that we can beggarly system. It is Scripture, but it's not Scripture to me. It's not Scripture about me. It's Scripture for my learning, but not for my following. So, we will be ending this hour early, and we will conclude why the Sabbath day? Is it to help us in avoid exhaustion? Yes, we should take off time from work and have a period of rest, but that's not the purpose of the Sabbath. The Sabbath day was never, well, you need a day of rest so you won't be exhausted and you know, have, a, have a, a heart attack being overworked. The Sabbath has another purpose, some other purpose. Now, some would say, well, the Sabbath day is to commemorate creation. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. No, somebody would say the Sabbath is to commemorate Israel's deliverance from the Egyptian bondage. That would be Deuteronomy 5, verses 12 through 15. And others would say, no, in Hebrews 4, verses 4 and 9, the Sabbath day is a picture of the heavenly rest. Well, it's not to help us avoid our exhaustion. It is to commemorate creation, because of course God observed the first one after the, the uh, six days of creation. Is it to celebrate Israel's deliverance from Egypt? Absolutely. Now why? He gave Israel the Sabbath day after bringing them out of Egypt. He gave them the law. The fourth commandment was, was observe the Sabbath day, keep it holy. 
The Sabbath day is not a type of the heavenly rest of God. It is a picture or a preview, a type of the earthly rest of God. Earth is the issue in Israel's program, the prophetic program. The heavenly hope is our hope, the dispensation of grace. There is no Sabbath day associated with the heavenly places and God's authority therein, but there is the Sabbath day and its association with the earthly kingdom of God there, the thousand years. Those six days of creation and the rest, that kingdom should have come on that next Sabbath, that next Saturday after the first Sabbath, and yet it didn't come because of sin. That's that earthly kingdom. That'll be brought about at the millennium. It is the earthly rest of God. And of course, yes, that would be Hebrews 4. Israel in the time to come after our dispensation, they're looking forward to Hebrews 3 and 4. Just like back with Moses coming out of Egypt, Israel coming out of Egypt, they were looking forward to going into the land too. Now what happened with them? They fell into sin as well. So the coming out of Egypt, if you remember from the Feast of Jehovah, the coming out of Egypt, back with Moses, that loops toward the coming out of the nations, coming out of Israel from the nations to go into that millennial reign at the second coming. So Israel was to reflect on God's purpose <clears throat> in creation in the first place by remembering His Word to them on the Sabbath day. So we will close now this psalm, this song was to be sung, Israel was to sing it, on the Sabbath day. Psalm 92, and we'll read the 15 verses and conclude. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto His name, O Most High. Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. Genesis 14, verses 19 and 22. Lucifer wanted to be like the Most High. He wanted to be possessor of heaven and earth. Here, God is possessor of heaven and earth. Why? Because He's reclaimed heaven and earth to Himself and that's the point of the Sabbath day, to have that earthly kingdom. His purpose in creation is being fulfilled in Psalm 92. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night, upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool, a fool understand this. When the wicked spring is the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. For thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. See that, see that possessor of heaven and earth? For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. Why? He's going to cleanse so he can have that millennial reign. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shall thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eyes also shall see my desire on mine enemies. And mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. See the trees of righteousness, Isaiah 61. Here's Israel, believing Israel. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. That was a song, if you read at the, the bottom the, the sub, uh, subheading of Psalm 92, a psalm or song for the Sabbath day. Israel was to sing that song, that psalm, 
every Sabbath day to reflect the fact that God is going to accomplish His purpose in creation. Now, they didn't know about the, uh, the heavenly uh, restoration. That's where we come in, the church, the body of Christ. But they did know at least about the earthly restoration and their role in it. They should have, but of course, you know, religion distracted them. And we need to be careful that it not distract us and that we not believe that we are the earthly people of God. No, we're the heavenly people. So you're going to get confused. You're going to be out of God's will if you don't write and divide the word of truth, like 2 Timothy 2.15 says. So, we have reached the end. I hope you have benefited, been edified, encouraged, and enlightened by the Sabbath day lessons. And we, I want to thank you for this opportunity to teach you. That was a lot of material, wasn't it? And plus we skimmed uh, at times. So Father God, thank you for these individuals who are willing to bear with me. And we consider it an honor to teach your word and that we may better grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and whose name we exalt forever. Amen. Au revoir.